welcome you guys to episode three of Life Beyond Sun Devil Football. I am your co-host, Danny Clark. We are going strong. We are grinding through this. Here's my co-host, Emily. We are excited to be back here for episode three. Make sure you go ahead and follow us on Instagram as well as YouTube and Twitter. Also follow my personal Instagram. Wouldn't kill you if you do that. That is Bannon.Clark, B-A-N-N-O-N dot C-L-A-R-K. Emily, where can they follow you? They can follow me at Emily Sasha, E-M-I-L-Y-S-A-C-I-A. Super There we go. And now we are super pumped for this episode. I'm excited myself. All my true Arizona State supporters definitely know who this guy is. He goes by the muscle hamster. You can't forget the man, Jacob Brimhaw. Jacob, how are you doing? What's going on, everybody? I'm doing well, just loving life outside of football. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. So we'll just get right into the interview and uh, start questioning you a little bit. Um, so we did some research, obviously, prior to this interview, and we found out that before uh, you really uh, decided to go to ASC, you kind of wanted to attend BYU, um, but you got persuaded to some degree to walk on to ASU by a fellow teammate and friend, Brandon Matthews, if I'm correct. Um, so kind of like, how did that whole interaction go down? And what was like the final factor that pushed you to play football at ASU? So ASU was always my dream school. Uh, I grew up in Mesa. Uh, ever since I, some of my earliest memories as a kid were just being in the stadium, listening to the vendors yelling for lemonade and stuff like that. Absolutely a sun devil through and through. Uh, when I was growing up or when I was getting ready to graduate high school, uh, I was attending camps, getting lots of combine or not combine invites, but, you know, lots of different uh, kind of opportunities to go visit different schools and see what was going on. Um, and unfortunately, ASU was one of the very few schools that never really reached out. Uh, I went to all the camps, went to everything that they had, and so just didn't really he hear anything. Uh, so when I was graduating, I was getting ready to go. Uh, you know, football was everything to me. That's all I wanted to do ever since I was a little kid. And when I graduated, uh, pretty much the only school that was going to give me an opportunity was BYU. Uh, so I went up there for a summer and fall semester, uh, pretty much worked out all summer with the team, did everything, all the conditioning, pretty much everything you don't want to do. That's not fun. That's what I was allowed to do. And all the fun stuff, I never got to even participate. Um, and so after that, I ended up serving a two year mission in Mexico City. Uh, when I came back, uh, one of the first things I did is I went to Camp T to go watch the ASU with my dad. It's something we'd always done since I was a little kid as well. Uh, when I was there, I knew Brandon Matthews was on the team, went down, they were doing a little thing where they circle around, say hey to all the fans. I went down and started talking to him and he told me, he's like, man, I guarantee you, you still, you still got the skills like you did in high school, then you can, you can make it here. So I went in immediately, that's all I needed, went and started talking to the coaches, started working as hard as I could to get my 40 ready for the tryouts and the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, you you definitely are a local product, as they call out here. You went to Mountain View, literally 15, 20 minutes away from the Tempe campus. Um, obviously, congratulations, obviously, in the Mountain View Hall of Fame. I know that was, I know that was a really big accomplishment for you. And then you, you are able to walk on, and then the nickname, the Muscle Hamster, comes along. Obviously, blows up. I know how kids are at Arizona State. Obviously, they yeah. take that information, and it goes wild. What was like a – was there like – were people just calling you Muscle, muscle Hamster just like – all across school like how did that just nickname come into fruition so it was not even ever a really big nickname it was kind of funny just as soon as yeah I guess to say the media as soon as that the name got out there it was really big but what happened was when I first started working out with ASU uh coach Graham told me or told me to go talk to coach Grizz and that I was he wanted me to be with the starting lifting group and not just with the walk-on groups that I had to go early and just to start getting me going with my full-on training and uh you know being a walk on and you go in and you tell the coaches that no one really thinks too much. Uh, so when I started picking up weight, they were going over form and all this stuff just to see how it was. But the good thing is at Mountain View, it's they make you do like two months of form classes before they even let you pick up weight in those weight classes at my high school. So my form was, it was on point. Uh, and so then I was able to start throwing up some weight pretty quick and started gaining weight really quick. And, uh, one of the guys, uh, one of the other walk-ons just goes, uh, Jake, you're like a little muscle hamster. And next thing I know is I kept hearing muscle hamster, muscle hamster, muscle hamster. And then we did not, uh, I did an interview. And next thing I see an article, it's the muscle hamster. And I'm like, how are they even finding out about this? <laughs> and honestly, it still followed me. Uh, Dr. Wheeler, you know, he still calls me muscle hamster. There's a bunch of other so people. It's so it's still carried on to this day. The nickname still It's actually still lives carried on. on more now than when I was wow. actually playing. Yeah. So that's the funny part. <laughs> That would be tough. Um, yeah. 
that's hilarious I love that it just kind of shows like the camaraderie of being like a part of a team so kind of going on uh that kind of like road what's it like playing with the same guys for four consecutive years like what impact does this have like once you graduate and you don't see them anymore and what's that like team what does that feel like to you uh, you know, there's definitely definitely a transition um, when you're coming out and, you know, if you've seen these same guys for four years, day in, day out, you have the same routine day in, day out. I mean, on weekends, you're in a hotel and then you go to a game and then at the, after the game, they're who you're hanging out with and it's just all day, every day. And then as soon as you graduate, it's like everyone just goes back to where they're from. So half the guys went to Texas, half the guys went to California, you know, lots of us stayed here in Arizona, you know, me being an AZ boy, I wasn't going anywhere, but it's unusual because, you know, I had to start kind of branching out again. It was almost like a new life. And that kind of sounds weird, but it is after college. It's more that more so than even in high schools, because in high school, yeah, you're building relationships and these friendships, but in college is kind of a real big point for you to grow and kind of find out who you are. So yeah. me being in there day in, day out with those same guys, uh, you know, I developed really great relationships who, you know, I'm going to be a, <laughs> a groomsman in a wedding for Cody Cole here in a couple of weeks. Uh, I've been a groomsman for a few other guys. So they're my brothers for life, but you know, truth is lots of them aren't here anymore. So we still stay in touch, but you know, you kind of have to realize that you need to be a little bit more uh, self-driven, self uh, motivated to get things going. Cause you're not just going to be there with multiple people around you all day, every day, pushing you to be better. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, for me, I guess, I feel like I've always had a good work ethic and thing like that. So the transition period, wasn't something too bad especially because I work in a company that is a team model uh, structure and so being part of another team you know it's it's my bread and butter it's what I'm used to so it, it's rough at first but you know just like everything else you got to adapt and learn and grow so it's been I've great heard, like a, a majority of like past football players like once they kind of stop it's like uh they have a hard time watching football yeah like I was talking I, to one guy and he said he couldn't watch football for a year uh, I, it, it killed me. Um, it was so hard. Uh, I remember my parents would ask me the first season after and the thing is I never missed an ASU game. You're talking, I'm 29 years old and I've never missed an ASU game. And so the first year after I graduated, I could watch it on TV, but I would have to be by myself because there'd be guys, I'd be sitting around a bunch of people and they'd be yelling stuff. I'm like, you guys don't even know what coverage they're in. You don't even know what the blitz, like the linebackers doing all this stuff. I could see what the coaches are trying to do. And so, and then half the time it was my friends that they were yelling at or calling idiots and something like that. So it was, I couldn't watch it around people. I had to be by myself and I could not go to ASU to watch the game either. Cause I almost fought a dude the one time I tried to, because he kept yelling what we should do. We were winning the game. So I don't know what yeah. his problem was, but uh, he kept yelling what we should do. And I just turned around one time and I was like, sir, do you know what coverage they're in? Because you keep saying to throw the ball, but it's just completely opposite of what they should be doing. He goes, no, they need to throw the ball. I was like, did, okay, what coverage are they in? Well, I don't know. I'm like, okay. And then from there, it kind of escalated, you know, but I calmed down. And so now it's gotten to the point where I, I enjoy it a little bit more. It's just a lot more fun for me. I don't, it's still not, you know, I'm not in there studying film every single day. So it's not something that I'm, you know, it's still something I'm passionate about, something that drives me and something that ASU will always be a part of me. So it's something that I, I want to be there and enjoy. Uh, and, uh, you know, now I get to take my mom and dad to games on the sideline and stuff like that. So that's always just a huge bonus. Perfect. Well, uh, when we were doing our research, we found something really interesting. We know that you were named oh. as the semi semifinalist for the 2017 William V. Campbell Trophy. So what was that moment like once you kind of found out you were named as a semifinalist? Well, I'll tell you how I found out. I was on the uh, practice tram. We were getting ready to go over to practice. And a kid came up to me. He was actually a GA who ended up, he was a quarterback, got injured, became a GA. And then now he's playing in Washington, Eastern Washington or something. Uh, Jack Smith, you know, he came up to me, hey, congrats. Said, For what? He goes, you're a William V. Campbell finalist or semifinalist. Said, What's that? <laughs> uh, they're like, oh, it's the, the academic one. I was like, oh, no way. And so I ran out there and all the coaches were congratulating me. I had no idea. And then after the practice, I came to a bunch of interviews and, I knew that I was up for it. They had spoken to me, but it was, you know, it was just part of my lifestyle, all the stuff that they're asking. And as far as, you know, good grades, community service, things like that, things that I had just grown up with and values. So it was, it was kind of just a blessing in disguise that I was up for that uh, because, you know, I didn't, you know, it was just how I lived my life. And so it was, it, I give a lot of the credit to that as to my parents and my family 
and pretty much everyone that helped me out with that. But when I found out, it was awesome. I absolutely loved it. Uh, my parents, I think, were a little bit more proud than even I was. Uh, but it was something really special uh, to know on a national level that it was just being, you know, even just a semifinalist recognized for that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that deserve a lot of attention for a lot of good that they're doing and, you know, working hard in their school and all that stuff. And so it was, it was just, uh, it was an emotional time when I found out. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. It's a big honor to definitely get that. That, that is 100% true. And I mean, we obviously that's congratulations for that award. And we know there's been a lot of bigger accomplishments that have happened in your AC career. I want to bring up a really important date. This is probably one of the better dates that you remember playing at Arizona State. I, okay. August 21st, 2015. Does that, that date at all recognize, ring a bell whatsoever? Sounds right before my sophomore year where I might have been sitting in a team huddle and uh, they gave a scholarship to Mitchell Frambroni and thought that I wasn't going to get one. And then I ended up getting one myself. There you go. That's that the, the exact date we're talking about there. A big date, obviously a huge accomplishment. All the hard work that you put in just to make it, especially a school that you cherish so much. You've talked about just even in the beginning of this podcast. And obviously there's a lot of bigger moments. There's that one. Obviously your last season playing at Arizona State. I know that that's a really tough feeling. We kind of touched base about how you couldn't even watch Arizona State games. You had to watch it by yourself. Just those big, big accomplishments and just big moments in your career. What, looking back, how did, how did that shape you as just a person today? And just, just remembering getting that scholarship and just kind of breaking down that story for us real quick. Well, getting the scholarship was a, honestly life changing. Um, at the time, I was working two jobs. Uh, you, you know, uh, on top of being a Division One athlete is just demanding in itself. It's you know, you have lifting at five thirty in the morning. Uh, then you'll have practices, film and stuff. Then you'll have a little gap and then you'll have to be in for like team lunch. And this is just in the off season. Uh, and it's all, it's all legal. Don't worry. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and so when they gave me the opportunity to have a scholarship, that's pretty much what I've been fighting for my, ever since I was a kid, that's what I wanted. Um, and the only thing of, that I remember is I could not wait to tell my parents uh, when that, when he said that I had been put on scholarship, honestly, it, that was the most emotional moment of my life. Uh, I, I still watch that video and I get chills. Uh, I honestly have it. It gave me the chills. I will say after seeing that video, like I, I saw the yeah. emotion kind of come out of you. And I always love, we always look at those scholarship moments every single time you see the compilations on all the big name markets for sports. And I, I feel like you obviously relate to all those guys because you've had to work so hard and working multiple jobs. We've interviewed a lot of people that were all pretty much we've had or been all walk-ons. Yeah. And one was a Postmates driver at one point. Like it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the amount of jobs that you have to do and the things that you have to accomplish, but just to do, to make that dream and for you to get that recognition and finally get that scholarship, it has to be an incredible feeling. Oh, it was incredible because I got to focus on just having fun and playing football, like, and, you know, enjoying actually being a college kid on top of, and just finishing my schooling and everything like that. So it was, I got to focus on college and I got to mm -hmm. be a college athlete and I got to do all that stuff. And without that scholarship, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And so that's something that I'll always be grateful for coach Graham and coach and uh, ASU for. So nothing but respect and love. <laughs> well, I will say we're going to switch it up a little bit here, Jacob. We have a segment on the show called check that tweet where we look through our guests Twitter. So it was really hard for me to find your Twitter. So it didn't really work out, but we do have your yeah. Instagram and I know Emily was doing a little stalking before. So she kind of got to help me out with this a little bit. She's joking. I'm totally joking about that. We don't check our guests <laughs> Instagram like that. This was all Bannon. This was I all me. I'm going to take it back to Halloween 2016. You talk about how great and an impact your parents have had on you. This was a really bad, a really cool photo, not a bad photo. It's a really cool photo of your mom dressed as Edward Scissorhands and you as, I, I guess, like, I don't even want to call it a vampire. I'm it, a sexy vampire. That's sex, what it it is. looks like this. I, I kind of look like a very, like, hip hipster like something like i i feel like i would wear so let's talk about that real quickly just the ins just the instagram halloween your mom's just as edward scissorhands let's, let's get a little context behind that photo and especially so, the outfit we gotta we gotta talk about nothing. the outfit that's nothing i'm embarrassed that that's the one that you guys had to do for my halloween if you keep going uh, i probably haven't saved on my phone i got a video of me in my joker outfit dancing out on mill and some black lights and stuff like that and oh it's well, we can get into i got that. the tattoos i, like I got better. the grill well, and then my my mother loves Halloween, so she actually gets hired to be Jack Sparrow, uh, Johnny Depp, 
Uh, she does Jack Sparrow. She does Edward Scissorhand. She does the Matt. She has the Mad Hatter. Uh, her Mad Hatter actually won her contest tickets, a talking stick to Disneyland. Um, so she wow. has loved Halloween for forever and she put it in me. And so I've loved it ever since, uh, you know, I was a kid. And then even as my, for my Eagle Scout project, when I was growing up, we turned my house into a haunted house we, in the backyard. We built a maze, we had everything. And then we shut it down and we charged admission and, uh, it was in freaking awesome. And then all the proceeds went to child crisis center, but Halloween's just because of my mom, she's obsessed with it. She's always been obsessed with it. And now it is instilled in me. And so I will be dressing up for the rest of my life. And is it a coincidence that all of the characters you're talking about are all Johnny Depp like roles? Is it like, is that, is like you got Jack Sparrow, Edward Scissorhands, like Mad Hatter. Mad like, Hatter. Oh, There's definitely like an obsession going is on. Is there an obsession with Johnny Depp and your mom? I'm just asking like out of a, out of a slight no. coincidence. The funny thing is my mom's man crush or the guy who she's always had a thing for is Tom Cruise. So I, I, where the Johnny Depp, yeah, I don't know. Where the Johnny Depp came from, clueless. But the, after she saw Jack Sparrow, she fell in love with it. And then everyone loved it. So she just started going down the line. She's even got Willy Wonka. And then she's got Oompa Loompas. Oh, my luckily gosh. I'm, luckily, I'm shaped like an Oompa Loompa. So it worked out nice. <laughs> well, that is pretty amazing. I love the family uh, camaraderie <laughs> there. Um, so we're going to, I just want to ask you a quick question, uh, kind of like after you ended your football career, you obviously were talking a little bit about like what you're doing now, but how's your career going now? And what does it feel like to kind of like look at yourself in this present moment and see what life is like now? It's, you know, it's, it's crazy how different your life is, you know, when you're outside of sports and all that stuff. And I get that it's hard to let the whole you know, it was really hard to let football go, you know, and it's still, there's still lots of time. I actually joined a flag league now that I play in. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those old guys that tries to keep it together. Uh, but you know, with work and everything, it's, you know, it just feels like there's a lot of purpose in what I do and there's lots of things that I'm helping. And, you know, I try to contribute, you know, being in a medical field. Um, so it's, there's a lot of things outside that's I guess that's kind of what's hard for a lot of people that goes they just don't know what they could be good at or whatever but the truth is as long as you have a go-getter attitude and you're always positive and you're trying to just improve and be better than whatever you decide to do you could be successful at it it's just whether you got to find something else that you're passionate about something that you enjoy to do and you know luckily for me I love being in the operating room and helping out with surgeries and you know covering surgery and so uh, and once again, like I said, with striker, it's a kind of a team focus. Like right now on the East Valley trauma side, we got five of us that are together as a team, constantly running around on the phone, talking, texting, uh, you know, working 60 to 70 hours a week on average, and then lots of time doing more, but it's, it keeps you busy. And so, you know, I don't really have time to miss football because I'm just a little yeah. too busy, but, I mean, uh, I think that's a good attitude to kind of like keep on is like just keeping yourself busy and then finding hobbies and, you know, being active like those are all great things to kind of help like transition into that lifestyle absolutely so there's there's a lot more that you're good at now i'm not saying you necessarily well you too but you know <laughs> every person there's a lot more to you than like what you believe or what you even think and you know so it's just going out being able to branch out and finding what's new for you and what you enjoy and it's amazing what you kind of find perfect well, real quickly, I know we, we were talking a lot more just about ASU football, but I want to keep it kind of on that way. But I know that you have played with some incredible players on that ASU squad, NFL talent especially. I mean, I know the names that kind of pop up for everyone just that follow sports and know the NFL. You got Nikhil Harry, um, Kalen, uh, Kalen Bodge, a guy that was basically running back as well as you were. Uh, you got Jalen Strong, another great wide receiver, and Demarius Randall, a great DB. What was like? What was it like sharing a locker room with just NFL talent or up and coming NFL talent? Maybe guys that were late round picks. Maybe just those guys are, of course, are the more notable ones and the guys that everyone can kind of think about when they think of ASU football. What was it like oh. playing alongside those guys? It's it's crazy because they're my friends. They're my brothers. That's kind of how I view them. And so it's all the time people ask me like, "Oh, dude, have you seen so and so? He's so sick." Blah blah. It's like, "Oh, you mean the homie? Yeah, he's cool." <laughs> you know and so it's, just, it's it's a different perspective so it is mm -hmm. in, it's awesome to see you know you turn on the tv on sunday you see Nikhil out there you know i've been i've seen Eno because i'm in arizona so i've been able to be around that mm -hmm. uh kaylin you know we still stay in contact and lots of the other guys still stay in contact with too so seeing that 
it's it's kind of cool just because you can see that ASU is elevating their, you know, you know, I guess the quality of player. I guess that's a bad yeah. way to put it. Negative. No, that's, I mean that is true. I mean that's like hundred percent so, true. You think about the quality, especially now that's coming up, even when you weren't playing. You think about yeah. all those insane guys that are coming. Oh, out. you think I don't follow those recruiting boards? I know. Oh, I know you. You're they're as passionate as an ASU yeah. fan that I've seen. I mean, like, come on now, like that's not even a question. Absolutely no. So I mean, just seeing the all the you know the products that are coming in and out and being able to produce that NFL, you know, recently with IUK and all that. Yeah. Uh, starting to not just produce NFL players, but some NFL players. And so that's nice. Uh, and, you know, growing up with them and kind of having that expectation now, and, you know, it, it kind of just elevates me. Like I want to be better. I want to be better at my profession, whatever I do, because they're doing the peak at the pinnacle of what they're doing. And so it pushes me too. And, you know, I just want to feel like I'm contributing to the ASU legacy. <laughs> you definitely are for sure. I mean, you have a lot of accomplishment accomplishments that you should be proud of. Um, yeah. Before we kind of get into the rapid fire questions, we just have one question to ask. Um, we want you to explain any embarrassing story you want about another ASU football player. You can make it as juicy as possible. Like we want to hear some cringy stuff going down. If you can think of anything. Well, <laughs> how PG do I got to keep it? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty PG, but I mean, like, do, it, it, we can go in depth as you want. We don't, we, I don't, we're not regulated by the FCC, so it's all fine. All right. So I'll just, nothing too crazy, but the best vacation I've ever had in my life was going into my junior year. It was me and like 10 of the guys on the team. Uh, I talked to everybody into going down to Rocky Point. And so we got a nice little penthouse down to Rocky Point. Okay. And it was the greatest five days of my life. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got a bunch of funny pictures, but so I remember that first night out. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to get anyone in trouble. Um, <laughs> and we cut it out if we need to. This is no, perfect. So it's, no, it's it's perfect. Nothing, We're going to keep rolling. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's nothing bad. I just remember walking into the bathroom the first thing as soon as we got to the club and I see a certain someone literally holding a, a trash can straight out in front of them, not even down, straight out in, for, in front of them, projectiling and then coming out and then just immediately buying another bottle and then going back to it. And then the rest of the night was just an absolutely disaster, but amazing at the same time. And so that's, I'll just say Rocky Point spring break. Side, Not yeah. much can be Quick, said. No, 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 this is fine. <laughs> Quick side note. We're talking about a penthouse. I mean, I get it. It's 11 guys, football players. Who Who is paying for this? Who is paying hey, for this? Y'all pitched in for this? Yeah, so what happens is Rock Point, about five bedrooms. Uh, it was five bedrooms, plus we had the little living room and patio couches and all that stuff, so you could actually sleep uh, 12 people. Um, and it only ended up being like 200 bucks a person, so it wasn't oh, bad at all. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you said 200 for the entire thing, like I would have been amazed by that. I know that wouldn't have been the case. Oh, no, no, no. Still... Like that, that was that was that sounds like an, That yeah, sounds yeah, like yeah. a fun weekend. I feel like for anyone right then and there, that's a, fun, that's a really <laughs> fun weekend, Hazardous, but fun. Has oh, of course, it's one hundred percent hazardous. It's Absolutely, break. it's spring break. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Unfortunately, right. it, we don't have that now, but not really is. But it's all good. But yeah, Jacob, we sucks. appreciate you coming on the show, my man. We're gonna hit you with some rapid fire questions. My Bannon's rapid fire questions. We got ten questions. You're not timed or anything. Just want you to say it as quick as you possibly can. Here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Favorite football team? Sun Devils. Best vacation destination. Ooh, uh, Cabo. Best pregame song before a game. That's tough. Throw something by Meek Mill, Drake, or some screamo. Is it Amen? Is it Amen? Uh, Burn, Going Bad. Now, Going Bad was not at that time. I know the <laughs> album. I know the album. Uh, uh, honestly, one of the biggest ones for me that kind of Money in the Grave was huge for me for a while. Uh, Meek Mill, pick a song. Uh, <laughs> Off the corner was big on for me. That one I played a lot. And then my freshman year, I was actually next to Jalen Strong, who's from Philly. So I fell in love with Meek Mill because he was always listening always to me. Always by Meek Mill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Favorite holiday. Ooh, let's go with Halloween. Funniest teammate you ever played with? <laughs> Frank Darby. Frank from Darby. Jersey, from Jersey. Absolute unit. Best advice you ever received, playing or not playing, just in general. 
So this is actually on my Instagram story is that it's not that simple as a lie. It, it can be done. There's always a way for it to be done. Okay. Okay. Well, dang, that was, I got really deep, but I, I like that. I like yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. No, I've that's had a good. That's motivational solid. day. That's good. <laughs> no, you're fun. Scale of one to 10, how good of a driver are you? I'm a finesse. I'm 10. 10? Like oh, yeah. Favorite football player you played with or against of all time? Favorite football player I played with or played against. This is going to get me some hate because of all the running backs in the group. But honestly, Kyle Middlebrooks, my freshman year, he was my roommate for traveling and all that stuff like that. Mm. Funniest dude, nicest guy, would help me out with everything. And it got to the point where my uncle would be taking pictures of me during the game. And every single time it was Kyle Middlebrooks right next to me because we were nice. just chopping it up. So okay. I'd have to say he's up there. He's okay, so he's up there. All right. Yeah, I, this, I, I, it would have to give me a little bit longer to think of best ever, but we, we'll go rapid one. fire. So it's all, yeah, it's all exactly. perfect. Right it's off all the top. perfect. All right, big question pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Last yes. question best food place to go to in Tempe? <sighs> in Tempe. In Tempe. <sighs> I mean, it... <sighs> you may get some hate depending on what you say. So you got you to gotta think quick. You got to think why. Holy That's what I'm thinking. Honestly, let's go with Chuck Box. I like Chuck Box. That was always the tradition for me. So we'll go with that. Okay. That's cool. a good one. I've never been there. I've always driven past it, but drove past it. But yeah. Yeah. It's uh it, it's necessary. You gotta give it a shot. It's necessary. Well, Jacob, we appreciate you coming on the show. Definitely one of our better favorite episodes we've got so far. We'll put all of your Instagram, all your Twitter, everything, you name it, on the down of the bio. Guys, make sure you go ahead and subscribe. And thank you guys for liking all the content. Jacob, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Works out.